Good morning, and welcome to the first ever Breakfast Tales. I'm your host, State. Grab a coffee, tea, or smoothie, and let's get started. Today, I'm going to start out with something that actually happened to me. I woke up on a morning just like this one to find myself in the confidence of a bona fide con man who used scams and frauds to steal and launder over $13 million. Today I will share my contacts with him and piece together what exactly he was involved in. This is the story of Nathan Joel Peachy and the rackets he ran as part of a shadowy organization which we will bring to light today. It's February 2nd, 2022, and a man named Nathan Joel Peachy was pacing about his Sioux Falls, South Dakota hotel room. Nathan's been a bit jammed up lately. On one side, he faced over 20 years in prison from the federal government of the United States. On the other, some of the money from the scheme that sent him to prison was now gone. He suspected some of his former associates of stealing it, with no regard for the supposed code of honor among thieves. What was Nathan to do? Well, he walked over to the desk and sat down at his computer. He opened a new email and began typing. Hans, your time is running out. I was the one that purchased the laptops and all hard drives that you stole from the general's office. These are mine, and I instructed Edgars to kindly request them back as he's in charge of the foundation. By the time he was done, the email was 541 words long. I will leave it on the screen now, so pause if you want to read the whole thing, but here's a brief summary. Nathan accused Hans of stealing silver dollar coins, laptops and hard drives from the home of someone named The General, claiming that the stuff belonged to The Foundation, which is run by someone named Edgars. He claimed Hans was working with someone named John Dimitrion on this heist and that he had evidence, satellite imagery and photos from a team he sent into Hans's house that documented the stolen property inside. He went on to mention that he, the general, and someone named Luba were all set up to go to jail by this John Dimitrion. Of course, Nathan didn't actually have any evidence. He didn't have a satellite taking x-ray pictures of Hans's house nor did he have a crack team of goons to illegally break in and start taking photos. Please return all the things that belong to Christian Charity to Edgar's immediately. Failing to do so within the next two hours, 12 o'clock p.m., I will call the FBI here myself and give them all the information on how you stole the silver dollars. You all left up and Jesus Berrios and John Dimitrion. He typed in Hans's email address, editor at stateoftheglobe.com and hit send. Now, Nathan had to wait for a response. But Hans's two-hour deadline came and went. Nathan tried calling Hans on Skype and long distance, no reply. Finally, about three hours later, an email from Hans finally came. If you want to discuss business, let's discuss. How do I know you have any of what you say you have on me? Well, Nathan had to convince him. My guys don't play. The general put me together with the best. We never steal anything from you. Why you steal from us? Mm, Weak, Nathan thought. He needed something more. He didn't actually have any proof. So what was he to send him? Nathan opened his word processor and began typing out what he thought an actual legal affidavit might look like. He attached it to the new email and just to make sure Hans was going to feel the burn, he wrote what was about to happen. Here is one of the affidavits I'm signing in about 30 minutes and then it will go out to all the intel agencies, FBI, Okokrim and Norwegian police by the time you get up in the morning. Nathan CC'd Edgars, who was waiting to take back the stuff, and he hit send. Unbeknownst to Nathan, 
His emails were not going to Hans. Oh man! Oh God! Oh man! Oh God! Oh man! Oh God! Oh man! Oh God! Oh man! You see, Nathan had made a bit of a mistake. He meant to send his emails to stateofglobe.com, belonging to Hans, but instead he typed stateofthegloob.com. A reasonable mistake, given that State of Globe doesn't quite sound right to a native English speaker. The emails were actually going to me, your humble narrator and owner of the web domain stateoftheglobe.com. And the replies going to Nathan were not Hans at all, but me playing along to see if A, this was real, and B, if so, what information I could drain from him. Well, people don't see the real me, right? They just see my fake online persona. When I received Nathan's first email, I didn't know what to make of it. In that three hours while Nathan was waiting for a reply, I showed it to a few people, and they guessed it was probably some scam and I should put it in my spam box. But I felt like something wasn't quite right. This didn't feel like a scam. How was this supposed to separate me from my money or my identity? What scammer would bother to create all of this elaborate lore, backstory, and people like this? I guess I was convincing enough in my replies, or at least Nathan was desperate enough to believe anything because he just couldn't stop replying to me and giving me more and more details I promptly kept investigating. The hordes of information I uncovered was massive. I looked into the people, the places, and the things in Nathan's world, and it was a wild, wild ride. What I discovered were a series of international frauds going on for years, culminating with the big one that basically landed him in prison. Thus says the Lord God, may the curse return to those that put it on me. But before we get to that, let's meet some of these people. The year is 2012. Felix Baumgartner jumped out of a helium balloon 39 kilometers above the Earth's surface. London wrapped up its Summer Olympics, finally deciding who the fastest guy who wants to go fast is. Korean rapper Psy released Gangnam Style, which quickly caught on but was subsequently called a cultural masterpiece by people like Boris Johnson, effectively killing any joy it gave anyone. And Julianne and John Dimitrion were quite the power couple living in Oahu, Hawaii. Move over, Bradjolina. Here comes Julianne. Julianne? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a bad joke. I knew as soon as I wrote it. It's like 15 years too late, and it wasn't funny then. And yeah, I kept it in. So deal with it. Anyways, the Dimitrion couple ran a local business called Mortgage Alliance. Hey you! There's a mortgage company in town I gotta tell you about! Ah, oh, low budget local television ads. That's the stuff. Um. Anyways, the Dimitrions exploited many people in their own community and ruined their lives by remortgaging their house out from under them and pocketing the money. When their scams finally caught up with them and they were facing prison time, they took off, becoming fugitives quickly making the FBI's most wanted list. It was quite a story, and even John Walsh covered it on a CNN show, The Hunt. And they never showed up to their sentencing. We found it very strange how two people with no passports, no friend, and no money could, could really leave an island. Several months later, the FBI got a tip. My fellow Americans, I'm here to tell you about the Republic. Your Republic for the United States of America. This group may have assisted them in fleeing the island. Rusa, the Republic for the United States of America, really believes that there needs to be a substitute government that someday will either overthrow or replace the existing democracy that we all function in. We believe that John may have actually convinced this group that, that he was a financial guru. He was able to monetize natural resources, and that's how they were going to fund the new society that they wanted. This group hatched a plan to smuggle John and Julianne off the island via a private jet. They made a very good escape uh, from this place. 
The legal entity, Republic for United States of America Humanitarian Trust, is registered at an inconspicuous little farmhouse in a town called Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, population 3,485. What's the significance of the farmhouse, you might ask? Why, it's the home of our sexy bearded protagonist, Nathan Joel Peachy, of course. Turns out Nathan has a long history with Rusa. At one point, he served as their chief justice. You won't find mention of him on their website today, but thanks to the Wayback Machine, I managed to find him there, along with recordings of Nathan speaking on conference calls. We have been officially listed on Homeland Security's website as a terrorist organization. And when you're part of a terrorist organization that has been officially graded that way, uh, you get treated much differently. At one time, RUSA was one of the most prominent sovereign citizen organizations in the US, but it took a big hit when the United States Department of Homeland Security put it on the domestic terrorism watch list, and after their president was sent to prison for fraud. The one from this ad? We have a national identification card for the Republic for the United States of America to show your support, and it also offers you protection under our laws of the Constitution. I loved him as a brother. We spent hours and hours together. Uh, you know, we love each other like a brother. Nathan kept these circles for years and worked along with a man named The General on several schemes right-winger conspiracy nuts and those that follow and laugh at them might remember. For the joke is on them! <laughs> Moving on. Another shout out from his email to Hans was a man named Jesus Berrios. Berrios, Nathan, and the general were all involved in a hard currency scam, where they bought and sold foreign currency, the Iraqi dinar in this case, with the promise of it appreciating in value. Because apparently the dinar was going to be worth more after Iraq sorts out its, you know, post-war issues. Oh, and apparently because Babylon was in modern Iraq, and according to the Bible, Babylon was prophesied to rise again, so this is definitely a sure thing. Anyway, how do I know they were involved in the scam? Well, because Jesus Berrios was detained at the US-Canada border crossing near Windsor, Ontario, with a trunk full of weapons and dinars valued at $7 million because he apparently was driving to deliver them to another member of the organization, but decided to cross the border to do some sightseeing in Niagara Falls first. I can't blame the guy, I mean, it's beautiful there. And I guess he just didn't know that border guards sometimes check vehicles? Those dinars were sitting in a Canadian police lockup and a pompous letter to claim them arrived from ITIG Limited, signed by General LWR, and it was titled 72 hour notice notice of demand i am the owner of itig trust it has come to my respective attention that the financial group for whom i represent is currently missing an allotment of iraqi dinar my people have located it inside the borders of canada where it has been detained by the cbsa since the 18th of november 2012 whilst being transported through Windsor, Canada port of entry by Jesus Berrios, who was then acting secretary for Noah's Ark Foundation. So, who was this General LWR, owner of Noah's Ark Foundation and ITIG Trust, a company easily in the running for most trustworthy company name of 2012? Well, the general turned out to not actually be a general at all nor has he ever held any military rank in his life that I could find. So the general appears to be one of those nicknames he made up for himself, like calling yourself Mr. Cool Ice. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. The crusty old codger's real name was Lauren William Rosier, and he was the hashtag boy boss of this mess from his mansion in Oslo, Norway, apparently where Peachy's silver dollar coins were being stored. Amazingly enough, ITIG was actually a real company registered in the UK, though it never produced any product or service I can find, 
and on the records for that business was a man named Edgar Zakrzewskis. Edgar's is a Latvian businessman, angel investor, and real estate entrepreneur, and I use those terms very loosely, whose expertise were actually shady government privatization auctions matching questionable wealthy individuals to governments seeking to sell their old Soviet state-owned assets. This was the same Edgar's that Nathan alluded to in his emails. Iraqi dinar scams via the Noah's Ark Foundation and whatever ITIG was, weren't the only sweaty bowling ball holes the general had his hairy little fingers in. He also had the Christian Charity Foundation Norway, which Edgar's was executor of, which is a completely real title. Entire Adun executor. This foundation was registered in Norway, but also in the USA, with a Latvian woman named Lubova Burkuta having the title of governor. Nathan referred to Aluba in his original email, and Luba is short for the name Lubova, meaning love in Slavic languages, and Burukta means jar in Latvian, so I guess her name is actually... Love Jar? This Love Jar was in fact the general's wife. She was indicted and extradited to the U.S. in April of 2022, and in her indictment documents, it was alleged she funneled money intended for humanitarian projects into their personal accounts in Norway. Before being extradited and indicted, she was caught sitting on over 2 million in silver coins in the couple's home in Oslo, Norway. Luba was in trouble for all of this, and her husband only avoided the same fate by, well, dying of cancer. Nathan claimed they were all set up, along with himself by Dimitrion, but I'm not so sure. The three didn't exactly hide their trails very well. Luba used bank accounts under her own name to siphon dirty, traceable money to accounts tied to her and her husband. And Nathan, well, what can you say about a man who emails a complete stranger and spits out all these details of the crimes that they committed? So, we've heard about mortgage fraud, currency scams, and a bunch of other stuff, but what's going on with these silver dollars? How did they, and we, end up here? Well, I give you the Joseph Project. It's the gang's attempt to rip people off in the echo chamber that they lived and breathed in, the estuary where the Christian right mixes with the sovereign citizen movement. The March 4th theory actually comes from sovereign citizen beliefs. Now, in the past, we haven't seen such a huge overlap, but in this case, QAnon, uh, certain QAnon followers have borrowed whole cloth from a belief that the last legitimate president was the 18th president. So this goes back to 1871. And uh, this is the belief that Trump will be actually inaugurated as our 19th president. Now, of course, this is illogical since he was the 45th. Uh, but what they believe is that there is, there has been no country known as the United States ever since it was unstuck from the gold standard. And uh, they don't believe that any amendment past the 16th amendment is valid. So they essentially believe that Ulysses S. Grant was the last American, uh, valid American president. The Joseph Project, set up by Nathan and several others, is an investment vehicle. The promise was that they would work on humanitarian projects all around the world, and bizarrely enough for humanitarian projects would somehow generate a return on investment of 5%. Spoiler alert, there were no humanitarian projects and there were no returns on investment. Nathan's Joseph Project enlisted the help of crooked snake oil salesmen from the Sovereign Citizens Movement, such as Bradley Tennyson, who was working at Genios Wealth Management in Mesa, Arizona, and used his position in the company to hawk Joseph Project to his clients. He got caught when one investor got cold feet after giving him $300,000. Another was Frederick Arias, whose mustache seemingly belied his good investment advice. Arias was arrested but pulled a John Dimitrion and fled, some say to Canada. Being sovereign citizens, they hated 
being subject to the de facto, their name for the corrupt thieves that run the US government. And of course, the best way to show their disdain for the corrupt thieves in the US government was to be corrupt thieves themselves. <laughs> what a story, Mark. The problem with hawking investments is that it's not a tiny thing you can pay cash for. You're not going to walk in and lay $300,000 on the table. It's done through bank transfers, and those are traceable. Someone was going to come calling about the money they were collecting sooner or later, and they had to launder it and hide it. They likely ran a number of money laundering operations, both in the US and in Europe. With Edgar's background of real estate and shady auctions of former Soviet government assets, I'll bet he helped them find places to park some of that money. But it's clear they also saw buying silver dollars as a way to hold some of that money. The government raided the general's mansion in the outskirts of Oslo, Norway, but they reportedly only confiscated about 3 million in silver coins. Which brings me to the final piece of this puzzle. I tried to fit all the stuff into one video. I tried so hard, and I failed. I hate two-parters too. When I was younger, I remember watching shows and looking at the time left and thinking, man, how are they going to resolve this problem? There's only five minutes left. And you know deep down it's coming, long before the words even show up on the screen. So I hate to do this to you, but the second half of this story will be in part two. I can't believe you've done this. Including the answers to such questions as, who is Hans? Where are those flippin' coins? What happened to all these people? What did Nathan do when I finally told him I'm not Hans? And what happened to Brad Jelena? Um, actually not that one. If you'd like to hear the rest of the story, and many others yet to come, subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, I'm always looking for new stuff to cover, so if you have something for me to make a video out of, feel free to leave me a comment. Thanks for watching.